So it's day 327. Today I want to update you on the missile strike in the Nipro. I want to talk about Solidar and Bakhmut, just give you a little update there. But I want to focus most of my time on the ISW's predictions and projections for what's going to happen this year and going on into the future in Ukraine. I will also give you a brief review of a, some additional news. I'll do that very quickly. Uh, I'll move very rapidly through the other articles and then we'll conclude with fun with Russian state media. Okay, the nine-story building that suffered a direct strike from the missile. What we know about it is that uh, the death toll has risen. And it, in this article, it rose to 30. In the next article, it rose to 36, but it rose, it was a multi-story residential building. About 1,700 people lived in that building before the strike, and so that's why it was so devastating. Russia fired uh, 33 cruise missiles on Saturday. 21 were shot down, but this one wasn't shot down. Uh, RT was claiming that the missile was shot down because of a uh, statement by a presidential advisor saying that the missile was shot down and apparently fell on the apartment building but exploded when it fall, uh, fell. That apparently did not happen. The Ukrainian military contradicted the presidential aide's account. This was car carried in RT that the Ukrainian military contradicted the president's account, which I found to be somewhat shocking that they would even carry that. But that's what was going on there. So 21 were shot down, 33 were fired. One of those hit that building. And the Russians were saying that the Russian armed forces don't target residential buildings or social infrastructure facilities. The attacks are only aimed at military targets, according to Peskov. But he lies and he's targeted buildings and other uh, residential areas, including uh, the city streets and playgrounds and all kinds of other things before. Here's another article from Radio for Europe, the death toll from a Russian missile strike on an apartment building. It's now 36. 36 people died, including two children dead. 75 people were injured, including 15 children, the police said on uh, Telegram. Now, the issue is that they targeted in Dnipro. Dnipro is actually nowhere near any military anything. And the Ukrainians made it clear that there are zero military targets around Dnipro. Let's turn our attention to Solidar and Bakhmut. So this is the British intelligence update. Over the weekend, intense fighting continued in both Crimea and Bakhmut sectors of the Donbass front. As of 15 January, yesterday, Ukrainian armed forces almost certainly maintained positions in Solidar, north of Bakhmut, and in the face of continued Wagner Group assault. So they're still there in the region, right around it. The main city looks like it's been held. Here's the deep state maps update. So they're probably right like right around here, kind of along the rim of Solodar, but they're still fighting. They're still contesting it. They haven't dropped back beyond the river here. Okay, but the really interesting thing about this is that Bakhmud is, they've been trying to take Bakhmud since the summer. Bakhmud's area is about 16 square miles. Solodar's square miles is about 4.75. So they can take something about a quarter of the size of Bakhmud in six months. So it's not really a tremendous victory, but it is a PR victory uh, to some degree. Okay, let's shift gears again and talk about the ISW. The Institute for the Study of War is one of the, the best sources for information of what's going on in the war in Ukraine. Uh, I read it fairly regularly, and today it was really robust. So we're going to go through a lot of things from the ISW, and I'll try to interpret some things. The Kremlin is belatedly taking personnel mobilization, reorganization, and industrial actions it realistically should have taken before launching the invasion in February. But they thought Ukraine was going to fall in a matter of a couple of weeks, and it didn't really matter because they just needed to show a big, strong front. They didn't actually need to have a, a working army in the sense that they need right now because they didn't expect the pushback. So it's taking these steps to, and conducting uh, the special military operation as a major conventional war. Remember, you can't even you can't even say war. You have to say special military operation because it's just this little thing. It's not a war, and you can go to jail for saying war, or at least be fined. Putin notably remarked on December 7th that this special military operation in Ukraine could be a lengthy process, and it will be because he has no will to stop. The Kremlin is likely uh, preparing to conduct a decisive strategic action in the next six months intended to regain the initiative. Now, decisive doesn't mean that it will end it, but they're 
trying to regain the, that momentum. Russia has failed to achieve most of its major operational objectives in Ukraine over the past 11 months. Russian forces failed to capture Kyiv, as well as Donetsk and Luhansk oblasts, and to maintain gains in Kharkiv oblast or hold the strategic city of Herzan, the Russian air and missile campaign targeting Ukrainian critical infrastructure under General Sergei Sergovin in late 2022, also failed to gener uh, generate uh, significant operational effects or demoralize Ukrainian society. Now, this missile campaign, this is all Sergovin. Like, nothing, like, when Sergovin came in, all the other things before him, he can't be blamed with. But this missile campaign, that came in on his watch. Putin has not changed his objectives for the war. I think that's true. The ISW has said it many times. I think he still wants all of uh, Ukraine. I don't think he'll have nearly the capacity to take all of Ukraine that he once did, but he still wants it. He is changing fundamental aspects of Russia's approach to the war by undertaking several new lines of effort. So in business, you talk about here's your strategy and these are your strategic goals. In the military, apparently line of effort is the equivalent. So this is... These are the, the ways that we're going to operate in order to strategically attack our opponent. Line of effort number one, uh, the Kremlin is intensifying both near and long range force generation efforts. They're forming new divisions. Ukrainian intelligence reported that the Kremlin seeks to raise the number of military personnel to 2 million in a unspecified date from about 1.35 million personnel. So more than half a million troops plan to be raised between now and the end of the war by Russia in order to win. Okay, line of effort number two, the Russian military is conserve, uh, conserving mobilized personnel for future use. That is, and, and this was really interesting to my mind because, yeah, that, that there's something right about this. Um, the Ukrainians have been fighting with Wagner in Bakhmut, right? Listen, Russia armed forces have not yet committed all mobilized personnel from the first mobilization wave to the front lines. Conventional Russian forces have not yet conducted major offensive operations and have mostly maintained defensive positions since a series of successful Ukrainian counteroffensives in the summer. Yeah, there's something to that. I think um, we're not seeing the full might of Russia being brought to bear, uh, and we won't until they have even fuller might but I don't know that that's going to make the difference. It's just, it's important to know that there's a lot being held in reserve. Russia is attempting, line three, Russia is attempting to reinvigorate its defense industrial base. This is what they need in order to fight the way that they fight. They, they, they fight with armor, with artillery, and they're running out of these things and they need to replenish it. Line of effort number four, Putin is recentralizing control of the war effort in Ukraine under the Ministry of Defense and appointed Russia's senior most uniformed officer, Chief of the General Staff, Valery Grasimov, as theater commander. I spent a lot of time on this on the last three days. I'm telling you, this is important. It is really, really important. Let me read on. The Kremlin appointed Grasimov as commander of the group uh, Joint Grouping of Forces in Ukraine on January 11th after the previously sidelining Grasimov throughout the full-scale invasion. Why was he sidelined? Well, yesterday I read an article where I showed you that he was sidelined because he wasn't part of the planning and he opposed it initially. Okay, but now he's brought out. The Russian Ministry of Defense also appointed three deputies to closely work with Gerasimov on the expanded scale of the tasks pertaining to the special military operation. So they brought him back out, they've reinvigorated him, but Gerasimov and his newly appointed deputies uh, to both prepare Russia for protracted war and take command of the major offensive in 2023, and he's going to fight differently. He fights on a, a full-throated war, not just militarily, but he's going to fight with propaganda, renewed. It's going to be a, a major propaganda effort. He'll fight you, you humanitarian. He'll fight in a sense of trying to cause more refugees to spill over the borders, to break up the, the uh, European alliance. That's the way this guy thinks from everything I understand of him. So that's going to be important. Line of effort number five, the Kremlin is intensifying its conditions of the Russian information space to support the war. The Kremlin's shaping the information space to regenerate support for invasion by reintroducing pre-February 24th narratives and undertaking measures to regain control of coverage as previously ceding this space to a variety of independent actors. So there's probably going to be some crackdown on some mill bloggers. Kremlin officials pr resumed promoting false narrative in late 2022 that the existence of an independent Ukraine 
Ukraine threatens Russian sovereignty and culture. It doesn't. But they've started saying that again in a renewed effort. And I, I, that, that rings true to my ears. Okay. The Kremlin effort to prepare for a likely intended decisive strategic action in 2023 is not mutually exclusive with the Kremlin's efforts to set conditions for a protracted war. So just because they're trying to have decisive action that gives them some real momentum doesn't mean they're not thinking long term. And when I say long term, I mean beyond 2023, 24, 25, what they're thinking long term, they're willing to go the distance. So just be aware that that's the way that they're that they're thinking. It's not going to be over anytime soon unless Ukraine can end it, because Russia certainly isn't going to. Strategic action in 2023 can manifest in multiple possible courses of action that are not multiple, uh, mutually exclusive. So courses of action include things like a major Russian offensive, most likely in Luhansk Oblast. Uh, number two, a Russian defensive operation to defeat and exploit a Ukrainian counter offensive. Like that counteroffensive, I think, would come, and I'm no military expert, so this is sheer speculation on my part, in somewhere in the middle, splitting it apart, and then trying to attack Crimea. And uh, that's, that's my, for my money, that's what I would argue. Okay. The most dangerous course of action of a Russian offensive against northern Ukraine remains unlikely at this time. However, the Kremlin is creating planning flexibility and will likely expand Russia's military presence in Belarus. They're already there on a training exercise right now. I'll show you the article, which could possibly support a combat operation in September of 2023. Okay, the Kremlin re retains its maximalist goals to seize all of Ukraine despite the poor conduct of the war to date, and Russian forces remain dangerous. There's one last thing I want to show you down here, actually two. The Wagner Group financier Krogosin awarded medals to Wagner Group forces for the capture of Solodar, likely in an ongoing effort to frame the capture of Solodar as a Wagner accomplishment rather than a joint effort of the Russian armed forces. He's doing that because he's making his name on their dead bodies. And then last, and I'll show you this article uh, in shortly, a uh, Russian service member reportedly detonated a grenade in a building where Russian uh, soldiers quartered in Belgorod Oblast in Russia, possibly in a fratricidal act of resistance against mobilization, but we don't actually know what his motives are. You know, it's being carried differently in the Russian media. It's being, being carried as uh, that it's just some kind of accident. He he fumbled the grenade or something along those lines, but we just don't know. Reuters is reporting that TASS news agency said that local officials there in that handling of the grenade talked about careless handling of the grenade, which caused it to explode, but nothing more than that, nothing fratricidal. Okay, the ISW was thick today. It's normally not that comprehensive, but it's a great source. Moving along, we're going to go through the headlines very quickly. Russia and Belarus started joint drills, sparking fears of a new Ukrainian offensive. The two countries will conduct Air Force drills from January 16th to February 1st using all Belarus military airfields and began joint army exercises. Okay, but while they're saying nothing to see here, nothing to see here. Remember that what happened about a year ago, right? And then they had the, the audacity to say, this is the U uh, Belarusian uh, leadership saying, we are ready for any provocative actions on the part of Ukraine. <laughs> I, you realize that what you did last year was a prov provocative action. Okay. Meanwhile, the U.S. is expanding Ukrainian training in Germany at the U.S. military base in Germany. The U.S. military's new expanded combat training of Ukrainian forces began in Germany on Sunday with the goal of getting a battalion of about 500 troops back on the battlefield to fight the Russians in the next five to eight weeks. So this is good. They'll get their training. They'll be back on the battlefield in no time, and this will help their fighting strength tremendously. Europe's warm winter is robbing Putin of a trump card. General Winter has been as unreliable as most of Russia's other generals in this war, and uh, it, it's not worked out exactly like the Russians were hoping. The Russians were hoping not only to turn the screws on Ukraine with this, but also to turn the screws on Europe in general and split apart the alliance. Okay, Zelensky gave a speech yesterday, and he turned his attention to the Russians, and he said, I want to say to all those in Russia, and from Russia, who even now could not utter even a few words of condemnation on this terror, even though they see and know everything perfectly well. Your cowardly silence, your attempt to wait out what is happening, will only end with those same terrorists coming after you one day. Evil is very sensitive to cowardice. Wow, what a great line. He's exactly right. 
Evil plays on cowardice. Evil always remembers those who fear it or try to bargain with it. And when it comes after you, there will be no one to protect you. And so what he's talking to is Russians in Russia. Look, you have to revolt. Now, this is a this is a really tough play because Russians have been just beat down politically to be apolitical. Like you can survive if you're apolitical and you don't threaten the government. And so generations of this, um, that that's how they function. It's it's like they're in some kind of bizarre denial about what's going on politically around them. Uh, but if Russia's goals are to generate another 500,000 or more, 700,000 soldiers, He's right. They're going to, your silence is going to cause them to continue to come after you, to mobilize, to send you to Ukraine to die. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's bad. Now, always looking for the leadership angle. And here I found an article where a former U.S. Army general said Putin has wound up basically creating a proxy war with the West. His fears about conflict with the West actually caused him to create the proxy war, which I thought was an interesting angle. I think that's right. This is a retired U.S. Army Brigadier General Kevin Ryan. He's now at a Harvard think tank. Um, Putin believed that the war was inevitable with the West. He saw NATO moving into countries in the former Warsaw Pact regions. Russia without Ukraine in its pocket was not really Russia that he thought it should be. And there was a huge miscalculation by the Russians. Again, he thought that they would be welcomed as heroes. That didn't work out. Uh, this does not mean that Russia has not seen some successes in Ukraine, where it has crippled much of the country's energy infrastructure. It sees much more land along the Black Sea coast. But Putin didn't get what he wanted. He was hoping to just absorb Ukraine the way he absorbed Crimea in 2014. Putin has essentially, quote, created this reality of war with the West. Now, that's really fascinating because he created it by being so worried about it that he had to act. And now he has what he deeply feared, including Finland and Sweden about to join NATO. One thing the West has to do, which may uh, may already be doing, it must stop debating every new class of weapon that it gives to Ukraine, and instead it should look at Ukraine as the forward line of this war. It should assume that Ukrainians are on our side and they are fighting this battle for us right now. If you look at it through that lens, it changes the way that you think about the war. It's not like, oh, well, you know, maybe we don't give this weapon because Putin could be worried about it. Then you start thinking, no, give them everything that they can so they can take the fight to the enemy as quickly as possible. And that really changes the dynamic. So this was an interesting article for that reason. Okay, Ukraine War Live updates. Putin says everything is going according to plan in Ukraine. Part of what's going on in Russia is that Putin can't ever been wrong about the, the process. He always has to say that everything's going according to plan. Here we are. Everything is going according to plan. In Ukraine, Putin says, the dynamics are positive. Everything is developing within the plan of the defense ministry and the general staff. If this is according to plan, you are the worst planner ever. This was terrible. This was like, how could you think that this would be a good idea to plan? But it's not. It's... I'm letting you off the hook because it's not going according to plan. It's not that you're the worst strategic planner. It's that you're lying about everything going according to plan. Okay, let's turn our attention to some fun with Russian state media. I only have two articles. The first was really interesting. It was talking about global political elite are skipping Davos. So neither Biden nor Macron nor Sunak or uh, leader Xi from China are going to be at the Davos Forum, which is interesting. Uh, it's usually a meeting of like the who's who around the world. The group of seven leaders, only German Chancellor Schultz is set to be in Davos this year with uh, European Commissioner President Ursula von der Leyen. So uh, I don't know what will come of this or whether anything useful will come forward. We'll see what Davos has to say. But this is a big meeting every year where the kind of global elite are getting together to, to try to hash things out. But it's hard to hash things out without the key players. So I, I don't know why RT carried this, but I just thought it was of interest. Now, this one, I understand a little bit better. NATO member state weighs in on proxy war against Russia. President of Croatia, Zoran Milanovic, said that he doesn't want to be an American slave. 
Now, this is really important to Putin because if he can split off a few NATO, perhaps NATO and EU members, he can weaken the coalition and he can get his way. The Croatian president went on to argue the plan cannot be to remove Putin. The plan cannot be sanctions, adding that such punitive measures are, quote, nonsense and we will not achieve anything with them, unquote. Okay, so he's got Orban from Hungary in his pocket and the president of Croatia. What else can he pull off? What he really wants is Germany, I think. If he can get Germany or France, he can really deeply split the, the coalition. Um, I don't think he's going to get Germany, but I think he really wants Germany. That's all I have today. If you've gotten some value, please like, share, subscribe, uh, hit the bell, do something. Tell me in your comments what you want me to talk about. I'm happy to try to talk about it within the framework of what I'm able to accomplish. If you want to give to a cause, there are links to Samaritan's Purse and United24 and others below. Please check those out. Thank you for supporting Ukraine. See you tomorrow.